Good morning and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for this session. Today we have with us Lucy Bariluck and she is going to be talking about when is the right time for someone with dementia to move into a care home. A very um, hot topic, I should say. So before Lucy gets started, let me tell you just a little bit about her. Lucy Bariluck has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She is presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She has been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She has lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy is also a consultant for private industry in the United States including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and Clinics of Texas. And Lucy would also like you to know she was a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. Lucy, welcome. Thank you so much. Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today we will be discussing when is the right time for someone with dementia to move into a care home. However, before I start, I want to let you know that today we are adding another service to this session. So after we finish the presentation, after I finish it, and you will have a chance to ask questions during it, the recording will stop and you will have an opportunity to remain on Zoom or if you're calling in for the next half hour. At that time, I will address any personal questions you may have regarding this topic. So you don't have you don't need to show your face or your name. The reason we're doing that is that yes, you have opportunities to ask questions during the sessions, but sometimes people are just not comfortable doing so, or they just don't feel they would rather sort of say it to me personally. So if you want to stay on for an extra half hour, as I said, the recording will be off, and I'll be very happy to um, answer or if you have any comments to make about the session. So with that, um, I guess, well, I'll ask, is it clear? Does anybody have any questions or and if you want to know a, a little bit more about or it's not clear? So here we go. Any questions? Oh, somebody's here from Montreal. I saw well, that. <laughs> OK, so let's get started. As Glenda said, um, we get a lot of questions about this particular topic. So I want to share one of the emails that I received from a, from a caregiver, and maybe some of you can a, will be able to recognize your own situation. And she says, Dear Lucy, I've been a caregiver for my husband for the past four and a half years. Mike suffers from dementia. It has uh, progressed dramatically in the past year. I find myself doing more each day in regards to his daily care needs. His behavior are also changed and he's becoming more difficult to manage. Our children are still in denial. And when I tell them how difficult it is for me to manage, they don't really want to hear. I'm starting to really resent caring for Mike, even though he was a very good husband and friend. I'm tired all the time and find that I get angry a lot of times. Physically, I'm drained and have developed many aches and pains in my whole body. I would never abandon Mike, but I was thinking maybe he will be better off in a care home. How does one uh, make such a decision and do I have the right to do so? I need some advice. And she signed it, Angela. Hmm. Well, thank you, Angela, for your email. You know, every situation is different, but I hope that our agenda today will help you decide what is best for you and for Mike as well as for our audience today. So I, as I said, um, I'm gonna be speaking in a more generalized way and your situation might be different, but I hope that you will get a few little tips or things that you need to think about. So um, please keep in mind though, that some caregivers are caring for someone who they never got along with and how difficult that must be. So you might be in a situation where your relationship with a parent was not good to begin with, or your partner or your husband or your spouse. So that if this is your situation, you, you know, I have to tell you, you're allowed to look at your own needs and decide if you want to continue caring. 
All right, so with that, can we go to the next slide, please? So let's look at our agenda. This is what I'm gonna try and, uh, and get through today. So when is the right time is, is one question. And then really what Angela was saying, how do you make this decision? Who should make the decision? What are the pros and cons of care homes? And there are, you know, it's not for everybody. But let's look at that. So how does a caregiver know when he or she can no longer manage the daily caregiving routines and planning responsibilities? You know, what signals alert the caregiver that he or she is in trouble of getting <clears throat> lost in caregiving? Can a caregiver who cherishes a loved one set limits or responsibilities without feeling guilty or morally bankrupt, you know? These are questions at the heart of, a su of, of successful long-term caring. Unfortunately, for most caregivers, these questions do not arise until they are feeling overwhelmed and depleted. Being able to say, no, I can no longer continue to provide care in this way may not only save the caregiver from emotional and physical burnout, but it can also be beneficial for the care receiver. So let's go to slide three, please. I think it's important to kind of look at these questions a little bit. And for those of you who want to have these PowerPoints, we will send them to you. Glenda will let you know later on. So, um, so knowing when someone with dementia should move into a care home, uh, can be very difficult. There's no doubt about it. You know, it's, and I know pers uh, personally, I went through that myself with my mother as well. And I can share a little bit about that later on. But I think the main thing to think about is whether your loved one's needs are being met at home, okay? Or whether they are at risk at home. So what do I mean by that they are at risk at home? You know, it could be as simply as, uh, as, as just, if you're not able to care for them properly, they are at risk at home. Or if they're falling and you cannot pick them up, they are at risk at home, okay? And if they refuse certain, uh, certain tasks that need to be done and you cannot do it, they are at risk at home. So our main, you know, main question might be, can you continue? And you need to ask yourself that, okay? Can you continue caring if you are physically and mentally stressed and burned out? Do you get angry, frustrated, and don't see the light at the end of the tunnel? So if you're feeling like that, I want to tell you that I give you permission to feel like that. You're allowed. But let's look at that a little bit closer. So what do we do? So if we can go to slide, the next slide, please. Okay. So let's look at the, the red flags that you are facing and should be taken into consideration when deciding if it's time to stop caring for the person at home. And I'm gonna emphasize this over and over again. Your needs and well-being should be your priority as well. Whenever we give lectures about caregiving, it's not, it's not one or the other. There has to be a balance. There has to be a balance in order to continue caring. Yes, the person might be the, is the one that is suffering and has all these things going on. Yes, that's true. But at the same time, your needs are important. So let's look at these red flags. I'm going to go into more detail with them. And at the end of that, if you have any questions, please write them down or put them in the chat and we'll open it up for a little bit more discussion. So what do, do I mean by difficult performing ADL activities? So we know with dementia, some people do perform some of those activities for themselves. You know, they could either maybe dress themselves a little bit, they eat on their own, but what if those ADL activities that they were able to perform, they're no longer able to do so? One of them, a big one, is when people stop being able to actually feed themselves, you know, and maybe they cannot uh, brush their teeth any longer, and maybe they cannot dress themselves. Now, what about there's changes in behavior? And we know with uh, dementia, for some people, their behavior does change. Um, they're starting to be more aggressive, both uh, verbally, physically, sexually, they are more agitated. This is very important to look at that, this particular issue. 
if their behavior changes in any way, and if, if they are aggressive in any way towards you or towards others, this is a huge big red flag. And I want to kind of stop here and say that if this is happening, if your if your uh, person that you're caring for has pushed you, um, has hit you, if they did it once, I believe they'll do it again because they don't have the ability or the capability or the insight to even recognize that they did anything wrong. So if this is happening to you now, never mind about where to you know care homes, you need to get support immediately. And we'll talk a little bit more about where you can do that. Now, the person may have become delusional, hallucinations. Sometimes that does happen with dementia and where they are accusing you or others of stealing, you're having an affair, you're not loyal. Um, they don't recognize you anymore. Um, things that, for example, seeing things that are not there and you're trying to convince them that they're, that's not the case. These are things that can really trigger and are red flags to what's going on. Now the person all of a sudden is wandering or maybe they're wandering again already. They're falling, sundowning. Um, and if they're falling, are you able to pick them up or have you had to get help in doing so? And the risk factor for them. Now sundowning, uh, day becomes night, night becomes day. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you able to sleep at night? I mean, these are things. And how are you managing with that? Now, they could be refusing, refusal of care. They don't want to bathe anymore. They don't want to eat. They don't want you to dress them. Could you just imagine how difficult that must be for you? Refusing to take medications is a big one. And uh, we know caregivers tell us. They try all kinds of things. The person refuses. What do you do then? What about incontinence? I know a lot of caregivers said, you know, that's the, you know, that's the, the point where I no longer can continue. Once they need to be wearing adult diapers, ask yourself, are you, are you comfortable and able to do so? And for some people you are, and that's all right. Now they could be increasing physical decline and health issues. All of a sudden, I know with my mom, you know, she had certain medical problems and then in the middle of my caregiving journey, she developed diabetes and had to have insulin injections that I always say was very difficult for me to be able to do that. Um, and again, if we look at yourself, the increase in physical and mental stress and burnout for yourself, are you no longer able to physically and mentally care for, the, for your family member or your friend? Um, and you're tired, you're stressed, you're not taking care of yourself. You, can, you recognize that you are angry and frustrated most of the time. You yell at them and sometimes even shake them. I mean, it takes a lot for someone to admit that. And I respect that because at least you recognize that this is something that you should not be doing. So this is a big red flag. And again, as I said, if they are being aggressive towards you, and if you're feeling that you're aggressive towards them, please, please get the help that you need. Now, I've said an awful lot, a lot of red flags out there. Let's open up to any questions or any thoughts that you have on that, and uh, maybe an experience that you went through that you could share with others. So you can simply unmute your microphone and I'll call on you by your name. If you have called in on your telephone, you can press star six and I'll call on you by your area code. And as I said, the uh, chat box will remain open. Um, we did have one question when you were uh, doing the first part of your presentation. And Christina would like to know where she can find a list of the articles perhaps that you've written. Is there well, something out there that we can share later? Yes, that's totally on my references. And okay. you have on this part. All the articles, I mean, this is from my own experience. This is the all the information that I'm talking to you about today is from the research, from articles. Um, so you have them all at the end of uh, of the references. Thank you, Lucy. Anyone yeah. have a, a, a question, a comment, um, some experience they've had in this making this a difficult decision? I think everybody's thinking about it, Lucy. <laughs> well, we'll get back to questions in a little while. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's an extremely difficult situation to deal with. And oh. um, 
Do you want to stop and take the question from Beth Ann? Sure. Go ahead, Beth Ann. Hi. Um, I just had to put, not, not recently, about two years ago, I had to put my mom in um, a memory care unit for a short period of time because I had been taking care of, um, well, my brother at first with a sudden medical mistake they made and he ended up in a coma on life support. And then I took care of him after that for about five months. My mom had a massive stroke the next day my because my brother passed away. Mm -hmm. And then five months later, my sister was diagnosed with stage four cancer and then she passed away. So my mom just kept having strokes and declining. Well, because I was taking care of everybody 24 seven, two at one time, my mom and my sister at one time, I wasn't taking care of myself, of course, and ended up with two life-threatening situations with myself. So during that time, luckily I had, I knew something was happening. So I found a place for her prior to that. And just putting her in for that week, I had such guilt. Mm. Um, even though I knew in my head, it was the best thing for her and the worst thing for me, what I just continued doing, you know, and I knew it had gotten to the point of no return. You know, I just felt, you know, I knew that at this place and I, I'd learned later, they weren't as good as I thought they were, you know. Um, but even though they were a five-star place, I checked them out and everything. And I knew there was no reason to feel guilty, but I still felt guilty. You know, it's just yeah. superwoman that we think we are, superman, whatever, and we're not. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, I knew getting to the point of no return was the worst thing as I was getting there. But I just couldn't do anything different under the circumstances of, of just losing my brother and my sister and my mom losing two children. Yes. Um, but I think just all I want to say, I guess, to everybody who's doing this, it's like it's either, you know, your parent goes down or you go down or both of you go down. Um, that was, you know, my experience. Um, and I just, you know, seeing those things, you know it, it's coming, you know it in your head and you have to listen to those things. So that's all. You know, yeah. my perspective. Thank you so much, Beth Ann. I mean, you're so honest uh, to be able to say that the guilt is there. Yeah. You know, the guilt doesn't go away. I mean, it lasts for a while. I have to say from my own experience too. But the guilt should not be the 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 decision making of what is the best thing for both of you at that point, really. And, you know, we tend to feel guilty. We have to say, you know, and I have to say, not, it's not to say that men don't believe you me. There are a lot of amazing caregiving men out there. But women, we have, we tend to have this, this issue of caring, you know, we're nurturers. We have to care. We have to take care of. So that's why I'm saying the guilt is going to be there, but it doesn't outweigh the necessity and you know when you are a caregiver and i knew for myself also at the time i was working i still had young kids at home and um i felt guilty there was no doubt about it but i knew that i had to do something that would protect her and dealing with guilt i mean we know that caregivers after they when they're they're the person they're caring for goes goes into a care home they're there you're not abandoning them you know you're not abandoning them i'm going to speak a little bit about the care homes they're not all wonderful there are negatives to them as well and we'll get we you know we'll get into that a little bit more are there any other questions or thoughts? Yeah, there's a couple in the chat box, but Barbara, I saw you first. Do you have a, a comment that you'd like to make? Well, I'm having trouble uh, typing in the comment and, and I've lost your, I can see you on the side of my screen, but I've lost the Zoom. Oh. I don't know to be able to see the meeting. I, uh, it's weird. Yeah. I don't know what's happened. <laughs> uh mm, so it's I, a technical issue but i can hear everybody okay well um, i just don't have the zoom meeting up anymore it's it's weird how interesting and i'm i don't have a lot of technical experience barbara to help you with that so just listen in and i'll try and read things uh mm -hmm. oh one of our one of our participants said log out log out and then log back in and yes that I, help that problem i was going to say that i was going to yeah. okay yeah, try that, Barbara. 
Um, okay, so to what we have in our chat box over here, um, can you address the guilt that pops up now and then after you've placed someone in a nursing home? Uh, that was from Mance. And yeah. then Tammy agreed with her um, that I'm right there with you. I feel awful, but mom hasn't fallen once since she entered memory care. Prior to that, she fell three to four times a day at home. Her last fall was so bad that we thought she had broken her ribs. Well, yeah. there you just answered that. Remember yeah. at the beginning of the session, I said the risk factor of staying at home. You know, as a caregiver, what are we doing? We're trying to protect that person, right? Because they're no longer able to care for themselves. So the guilt cannot outweigh the risk factor. So thank you so much for saying that. You said it better than I could. I mean, your mom has not fallen. And so you have eliminated that risk factor. Could you imagine if she stayed home and kept falling and God forbid, you know, it could have ended tragically or going to hospital or even death, I have to say. So thank you for sharing that. So the guilt's going to come, the guilt's going to come back and forth, but then stop for a minute, take 10 big breaths and say to yourself, but what has, what is the positive thing that came out of this? And the positive thing is that mom was not falling any longer. True, true. Okay, so, so let's review this a little bit. So if a person's dementia has progressed far enough that they need more care and support than you can provide, it may be time for them to go into care home. At this point, they may need 24-hour care. So, you know, we know that dementia is progressive, meaning the person with the condition will require more care and support as time goes on. As your loved one's condition declines, their needs increase, and you may not be able to fully meet those needs despite your best efforts. As I said, they may need 24-hour care and support that one person cannot manage that alone. Forget it and do it on your own. So this is one example of a number of reasons why it might be time for people with dementia to move into a care home. Other reasons include hospital admission. Sometimes they land up in hospital and from there, uh, it's been evaluated that they cannot go home. Um, worrying about your, of your loved one's safety on their behavior becomes unmanageable, okay? So caring for a loved one with dementia is always going to be an uphill battle and becomes more challenging as times go on. Not for everybody, I have to tell you. Some people that have dementia, their personality changes. They might have been extremely difficult people before, and during the dementia, they're, you know, they're going along, they're letting you do what it is that needs to be done. But unfortunately, a higher percentage, it does get very difficult. So let's look at, so, you know, one of the things that I was going to talk about, so who makes the decision? Next slide, please. What I want to say, and all the research tells us that in all, it involves all parties, believe it or not, including the person in question. And I'm going to go review that a little bit more, especially if they have dementia. And it's really important to involve healthcare workers. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So when uh, making the decision to put someone into a home care, it's important to involve all parties, as I said, including the person themselves. Even if the person in question does not have the mental capacity to be involved in the decision-making process about the move, you should still involve them and make them feel valued and um, considered. Where, where possible, do offer them choices to give them a feeling of control and always be positive and upbeat unless you see that talking about it really makes them agitated, okay? So I would say at that point, you kind of maybe need to let it go. This can be a really difficult and upsetting time for everyone. So it's important not to rush conversation, allow all family members enough time to come to terms with the move and to put proper plans in place to reassure the person they will not uh, be, um, they will be looked after well and that you are not abandoning them. 
So if family member in question lacks the mental capacity to know what is in their best interest, so obviously you're going to be the one who's going to have to make this decision. But again, there's other family members involved, and I think it is very, very important to, for example, with, um, with the person who wrote to me, her children were still in denial, you know, they didn't want that to go anywhere, so they have to be involved. So when you've decided that you can't continue to be your loved one's caregiver, how do you break it to the family? And how do you manage your own feelings of sadness and guilt? Or for that matter of relief, some people feel relief. And what I want to tell you is you're allowed to feel that way. No one should be uh, caregiving if you don't want to or you cannot do it. Okay, so that's the other side of the spectrum. There is guilt, but for some people, there's tremendous relief. I can't do this, and it's okay. I'd rather someone say that to themselves and be honest than continue caring in a situation where they're getting angrier, more upset, more stressed, and not able to cope. So, you know, other people don't always like uh, or understand your decision. I'm going to talk about this very famous um, doctor, Stephen Zaret. Uh, he's a professor in the Human Development and Family Human uh, Studies Department at Pennsylvania State University, and he's a caregiver support group leader. He has developed uh, a lot of research, and I have to say that in, when I was learning at the university uh, around uh, social work, he was one of the authors that we really considered as a leader. So, you know, and he says, we all have limits on what we are able to do. And if we have done the best we can and can go on, we shouldn't feel guilty. Um, it's normal to feel guilty when you decide to stop being a caregiver for a loved one. But I really believe that you need to think about yourself as well and what is the best for the person that you're caring for. So um, one of the ways when I said, how do you, you know, how do you make the decision? Communication is key, okay? You need to communicate with everyone that's involved with that person, including that person, when it's uh, applicable, obviously. In dementia, you can have dementia, but you could still have you know, you could still recognize people. There's different stages of dementia. So if there's the early stages or it's the middle stages and the person can still understand what you're saying, include them. So communication. What I would really, really suggest is as you organize a family meeting. Uh, but for some families, it makes sense to find a neutral third party with clinical training to manage or attend the meeting. So here we go. Your local area agency on aging may be able to recommend a geriatric care manager, an elder mediator, or a family therapist to help facilitate your decisions. So when you explain um, to the family that's, that something needs to change, make it clear that you are not telling them what you want. You know, you're not telling them they have to become the caregiver now, but you're telling them that a decision needs to be made about placement. So I'd like to open it up for questions. I think it's a good time to look at what I'm saying to you. Does it make sense? Has anyone gone through this? What are your experience with that? All right, so unmute your phone. If you've dialed in on your telephone, you can press star six. Uh, the chat box is always open. Um, I see that we have a question from Robert, and it's something I haven't ever thought of before, Lucy. Um, does the entry into a care home require the signature of the person being placed? That's an excellent question. And maybe Glenda, well, you said you have never thought about it. No. I, can, <laughs> I can tell you that, um, Back here in Canada, uh, before you are able to actually, I'll use the word place someone into a care home, the person needs to sign it, okay? But the issue is, have they been declared competent or not, okay? So these are, this is another whole lecture that Dr. Elliot uh, Sklar and I do about documentation that you need to do prior, as soon as you know someone has been uh, diagnosed with dementia is, you know, making a will, obviously, um, uh, there has to be a living will as well, what decision making. And so 
in the States, I would assume that the person still needs, if they are not declared incompetent, meaning that they're still able to make decisions for, me, for themselves, I would assume, now I hope I'm right, that they do need to sign. Yes. Glenda, do you have any thoughts on that? That would be, that was exactly what I was thinking also, Lucy, is if, if that person is competent, I think that they would have to sign the form. If not, then uh, you it would fall on powers of attorney and all of that other legal issue. And that's, like you said, that's why it's so important to have these documents in place early on in your caregiving journey. Um, I also wanted to tell you that there is a national source to find professional care managers. I'll put it up in the chat box, the uh, web address, but for those of you on the phone at home, um, it's uh, www.aginglifecare, and that's all one word, aginglifecare.org. And you should be able to go to that website, probably put in your zip code, and it will give you uh, care managers in your area. If the Area Agency on Aging doesn't have a resource there or it's not convenient, this is another way to find it. Um, let's see, Mance says that my husband was declared incompetent and she signed all of the forms for him. So yeah, I think that goes along with what you and I were talking about, Lucy. Yeah, and, and somebody else said, uh, normally even, can you read that for me? Oh uh, yeah. Normally, even a competent person would refer to that adult child or responsible party to sign their paperwork. Well, maybe. Uh, Mance is in Houston, Texas, so she's a Texan. And um, what I will say to you is I'll try and find an answer um, to put on our follow-up email that comes out to everybody. I'll make sure that, that we are correct, Lucy, and I'll put that in our responses then. Yeah. You know, I think... Regardless of what the the ethical, it's not the ethical, but what the decisions are, and I'm, thank you for that, Glenda. I think that's really important. I mean, it's if the person is still able to um, to sort of know what's going on, mm -hmm. I would think that it's really important to include them, and that's why I put it in that it is important to include them in in talking about. It takes time. It's not something that you lay on them and the next day they're gone. Okay, so next slide, please. Thank you. Pros of care homes. I'm going to also tell you the cons of care homes, all right? Um, you know, so let's re realistically look at that. And as uh, one of the, one of the uh, ladies that spoke up, she said that not all care homes are, are good care homes. You know, we have to be very, very careful with that. But the pros in many cases are that their medical and non-medical care is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Staff uh, ensures medication are taken appropriately. All personal care needs are taken care of, hopefully. Meals and housekeeping are provided. Most facilities offer activities and outings. Uh, and that people when, you know, for some people, I have to tell you that for some care receivers going into a care home and being having social activities, they really flourish in them. I've seen that for myself. I was in charge of many long-term care, uh, care facilities back here. And, and the physical environment uh, is accessible and includes safeguards for wandering and things like that. So I see that there's a lot of things popping up. So before I talk about the cons, let's see what are people saying on the chat. Ooh, man, we're busy today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so Pam says, when my dad began declining, my mom contacted an elder care, Medicare specific lawyer. Oh. And I would think it might be Medicare and Medicaid also. Um, they guided us through getting all the paperwork and power of attorneys in place. And so that that says what we were saying, Lucy, you got to have those things in place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's so important. Then Matt said the home where I placed my husband had an assessment done by a nurse and a memory care coordinator. He scored very low. There is a very long form that the home sent to his doctor who had to fill it out before I could move in there. And they, they would not accept him without these forms. And so it's just not that you decide one day and you sign something and off your person goes. It's a, it's a process. And I think that's what Mance is talking about. You have to jump through some hoops and your doctor probably is involved in uh, re 
in answering some of those uh, questions. And then Robert says, and this is a good one. Yes, Medicaid, Pam, that's what I thought because, you know, that for long-term care in a care home, it is about Medicaid in the United States. So Robert said, who who determines if a person is incompetent? Is this medical providers, legal professionals, or both? Well, it's a great question. And I have to tell you that here, it takes a social worker and a doctor to actually fill out this form. So I would think it would be about the same back in the States, but maybe that's something that we could look into, Glenda. Yeah, um, and what I do know that it is a legal process here in the United States. And so I think there are, in addition to the doctors and uh, physicians, there are also gonna be um, lawyers involved. And it's an expensive process from what I understand. Um, but I will get some more information and put it on our follow-up email. Um, Mansa also suggested that the Alzheimer's Association is a very helpful place where to start the process. They're very informative um, and have support groups, et cetera. And yes, I second that, Mansa. That's, that's a good resource. Um, Beth Ann had her hand up. Uh, just my experience again with my mom who had all the number of strokes Um, You you didn't know what was going on in her head because she lost ability to communicate. And what her doctor, she had a geriatric doctor for a number of years. He knew her very well and I trusted him implicitly. He assessed her and said she knew what was going on. She just couldn't communicate it. So that was a very interesting. So she was cognitively capable of making her own decisions and, you know, um, just asking the right questions to get her to you know, acknowledge, you know, yeses and noes, nodding her head and everything. So that's something that some, you know, maybe some people would want to also consider too, you know, that it may not be a dementia related thing or a cognitive thing. It could be a communication thing. So uh-huh. to have them, their input on their, you know, where, what their decision would be, what they want to do. I just happen to put my mom in a memory care unit because of, of that you know, because you couldn't communicate, I thought it would work out better that they'd understand it a little more. And yeah. the issue was they put her in a dark room in the dining room by herself. She had dysphagia, so she couldn't swallow. They gave her water, even though I told them she can't have water because she would choke, you know. And so that was my issue that I found out after the fact. Um, so not it's not the place necessarily. It could be the care. You know, maybe they had a CNA that day that just filled in or something. You know, so I just want to clarify that too. Yet there are bad places too, because we had that as well. <laughs> well, we'll talk, we definitely, we'll talk about the cons for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. you for sharing that, Beth Ann. Thank you. And uh, one more um, comment from Mance, and then I think looking at the clock, we're going to have to move on. But as as Lucy said at the beginning, we're going to stay over for about half an hour. And so if, if we're not answering your questions, you have more questions, stay with us after that and we'll get to it. Uh, Mance said their husband took many neurological and psychological tests over several years done by Medicare, covered by Medicare, excuse me, done by a neurologist, psycho, well, well anyway. <laughs> And we can see a lot of decline. And so I think what she's talking about there is that she was involved with a medical professional over the years who knew her husband very well when they came to the process of uh, making these kind of decisions. Thank you for that. Yes. um, Let's just quickly go through the cons and then we'll we'll continue because I'm looking at the clock. Okay, so we heard there are some cons. Not every place is the right place, you know, lots. And for some people who are living at home, let's say be still living on their own, but declining. So there is a loss of independency. Um, Some people have difficulty adjusting to a new place, you know. Um, and many residents have um, restrictions on food and and the food isn't food is a big issue. People really enjoy their meals. So you have to be careful about that as well. And a large um, a proportion of residents have dementia um, 
patients in there, which can cause all kinds of issues for uh, one another. Uh, long distance to a facility, I mean, it's really important that location, 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 that the person is near to you. And staffing changes make it difficult to build relationship with staff. And not all staff, unfortunately. Most people that work in the healthcare system are really caring individuals and care homes, I have to say, from my own experience. But not everyone is. And so these are things that that's why. Uh, caregivers continue visiting when they go, when someone is placed in a care home and to be very vigilant about uh, all these things as well. So let's go to the next slide, please. So where do I go from here? Okay, and somebody said that. Thank you for that. First step, get an assessment. I think call your area um, agency on aging and ask for an assessment to be done by a healthcare worker at the home. Let them know that you are no longer able to care. You know, the assessment of the care receiver should give you a very good indication how much care they do need and what care homes they, you need to look for. So this was something that somebody did um, um, say that in the chat. And the thing is that you have to start visiting care homes. And what the one of the biggest issues is the to consider is the cost and the finances. Okay, these are things you need to look at. And again, location is very important. Um, obviously, the environment, the staff, the culture. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it and we'll open it up for discussions as well. Um, you know, you really need to look at once you have that assessment, the level of care that the person that you're caring for needs and to make sure that that home can provide that. And of course, you have to go visit. Um, I would also look at what activities are offered in that setting. Can um, your loved one be part of that? What what about the rooms? Um, are you looking for something? Does the person need um, their own private bathroom? Can they bring some personal things to the to this place, like pictures or paintings or even a piece of furniture? Is the place culturally sensitive regarding the language? What if your family member only maybe speaks Spanish or another language? What about the food? Big issue with food. Uh, it's okay to go there and even ask, can I have a meal? Can I see what it tastes like? Do they have um, music? Are there activities? What about religious beliefs? Is there a possibility if your loved one is religious and really would value having spirituality? Uh, the staff is very important. How do, you know, take a look, see how they react. How do they treat uh, their patients? Um, do they seem warm, kind? One of the things like you can, you might notice, do they knock on the door before entering a door? You know, the whole issue of respect. It's okay to ask other caregivers who are there uh, and have placed the, their loved one, ask them question, what's happening? How do you feel? Do you think that you're, the person is getting the care that, uh, that they need? You know, the other thing is, how do they deal with emergencies like fires, evacuations? Uh, we just went through a pandemic. You know, what if something does happen? Do they have doctors and staff? Is there a, a physiotherapist as well if your person needs a little bit more physio? Um, and do they provide the family with information on how the person is actually functioning? I've said an awful lot to you today. It's a big topic. We could have spent three hours talking about everything individually, but I did want to give you an overview, um, a very quick overview, uh, and, and to sort of tell you that um, if you're no longer able to care, please do yourself a favor and the person you're caring for and look into all these situations. A good assessment at home is really, really important. And the last slide for the person who was asking about all the information that I've gathered for you today, here are the references. They're easy. It's um, You can go on there. Uh, you can read them a little bit more in depth for yourself. It'll validate for you a lot of what's going on in your own life. Now, as I'm looking at the time, okay, we're getting up there. Let's open it up for some more questions and uh, your thoughts. I really would love to hear your thoughts um, about your own experience because 
caregivers sharing with us. And then I will share my experience with my mother and what happened. Right. Mance, please go ahead. She's been she's been patiently waiting. Okay. Um, I have patience. <laughs> Alzheimer's has taught me that. Uh, um, yes. It, it was a very difficult decision to make. Um, the social worker I work with, who was at the daycare center my husband attended for several years, uh, she told me when I asked her the question, when do I know uh, when it's time to place him? And she said she knew him very well, too. And she said, you will know. And we took a walk one day. We were taking a walk, a daily walk. And he something happened and he fell down and took me down with him. Mm -hmm. And that was the drop. And I said, I can't do this anymore. The man that um, the car was coming, the man parked his car and he helped us to a bench. And um, that was my decision making factor. Um, after that, I did not, um, I had started visiting a lot of nursing homes and I had decided which one I wanted to go to. And um, I had done that three years prior and I still maintained that same decision. It was the best place for us, for him. And um, he was attending a daycare and then at the, during the pandemic they closed down they reopened um at some point and he attended again but he had declined to a point where he could not continue in the afternoon and so I, I, he stopped going and I had a caregiver here at home with him for 20 hours a week because I needed the break but it wasn't enough and he was starting to resent that. And she was not very challenging to him. And he was isolated because we were reluctant to go out and go anywhere. So uh, it was the best decision to place him. And then I, I acted on it and he was placed within three weeks. I did not involve him, which created a lot of difficult moments on the day I brought him to the nursing home um but I survived it and so did he and it was a year yesterday which was a difficult day for me but um I survived that too and it's it comes up once in a while the guilt but he needs to be there because I became ill, very ill the day after I placed him. Yes. I have a stage four cancer that is incurable and inoperable. So he has to be there. I could not take care of him anymore. But um, it's, it's difficult. It's still difficult at times. Um, so good luck to the people who have to make the decision. It's tough. Thank you, Mance. You've touched my heart for sure. Mance, you um, brought some tears to my eyes. I mean, everything that I was trying to portray today, you've said it all. And I thank you so much for that. And I wish you all the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mance. Um, Robert had a question. He's had some really good questions today, Robert has. He's been thinking about this. Yes. He said requesting an assessment is easy, but what happens if the person is not willing to participate in the assessment? I'm, I'm thinking about entry assessment going into um, a facility. Robert, that's a great question, but I think you're going to have to um, give a lot of credit to professionals who work in the healthcare system. Sometimes a person doesn't need to have answer any questions for us to recognize their limitations and also to make sure and to get the information from the care receiver as well. Um, it's not an easy process for sure, but um, you know, there it's not just asking what's your name or what day is it and who's the president of the United States. You can tell 
by the way some people have very good social graces and they kind of know how to get around certain things but I do believe that professionals can pick up on what the limitations of the person is assessments are so important because it validates for you also that it is time and I want to also tell you that even if it's not time, and I so appreciate Mans for saying what you did about hiring help, you did hire help. It wasn't enough, but it wasn't something that uh, that was useful for him as well. And so, you know, again, I'm going back to the situation that guilt's going to be there, but it's not an even or situation. We're dealing with two human beings. Your needs are as important as that person's. You cannot sacrifice your life. And what I want to say is, if you look at research, and I look a lot at research, and I've done a lot of research, many caregivers pass away before their care receiver, unfortunately, because the stress of caregiving affects your physical well-being. It's a known fact. I know people it sometimes have a hard time accepting that, but if you're constantly stressed, it will affect your medical well-being. Yes, it's true. Uh, I had that happen in my own family. Lucy, I think I've mentioned this before. My mother was diagnosed with lung cancer and my dad was her primary caregiver. And he ended up dying before she did because he gave his all. They had been married, you know, 60 some odd years. And so that is a true thing that research is showing, uh, Lucy. Um, Michelle asks, what if the loved one doesn't want to go to a care home when they need to? Mm, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. And maybe if you want it, if you are able to stay, um, I know that Glenda is going to give us some information. And as I said to you before, what we're going to do is at, at 12 o'clock, we are going to stop the recording, but you're still going to be on the phone and on the Zoom. And I will personally answer questions that are more personal and need a little bit. We will take like a two minute break if anybody needs to go to the toity or get a drink, whatever. And this is a service that I thought we would, it's a pilot project that I'm going to be doing uh, if, if, it, if there's a need, obviously. Uh, every time I present. So Michelle, if you could stay on, I would appreciate it. Right. And that was 12 o'clock um, her time. <laughs> It'll be 11 o'clock central time. So all of you are going, oh, we're going to stay on here for two Yeah, hours. sorry, sorry. It's my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have about five minutes. And there's a few things that I wrote down, uh, Lucy, that I'd like to share. Um, and I've got to do some more research. Um, in most states, you're going to find um, through your state health services or human services that they have a nursing home compare um, tool where you can look at nursing homes and compare them to each other. I'm going to find some information on that. You can also find complaints that have been lodged against nursing facilities and whether they were validated or not validated. And I think a very important thing that we didn't touch on, Lucy, is talking about the ombudsman program. All of our nursing homes in the United States have an ombudsman program, and those per persons are trained and are advocates. And so there should be a sign in every single nursing home that tells you how to reach an ombudsman. Funny word, but it's a really good program. So I wanted to encourage you to look for that, too. Um, let's see. I wanted to tell you what's coming up on the Carrier Vitella Connection real quick before we close also for the first part and take our little break. Um, let's see. I'm looking at your other. Yeah, well, Thursday, February the 16th, Lucy will be back with you with Dr. Elliot Montgomery Sklar, and they are doing a series in engaging caregivers, a program for healthcare workers. So if any of you are professional caregivers, you may want to tune into that. Even if you're not, it's always good. They're going to be talking about difficult situations and elder abuse. And so that's at 10 o'clock central time. Um, also on the 16th, I'll be back with you with Dr. Natalie Oller. If you haven't seen her, I also want you to, you know, tune in. She's going to be talking about mental health and aging, and she's a wonderful presenter. That'll be at noon on the 16th. So that's what's coming up on the caregiver teleconnection. And I see my picture is going all crazy again. It does that every once in a while, but it's, it's back now. Uh, so we have about three minutes. Let me go over here. 
Um, my mom, this is Tammy. My mom begs to come home. She packs up all her things because she wants to come home every day. Um, that's a hard situation, but if it's someone with dementia, I've heard Dr. Tam Cummings, Lucy, on our on our call before talking about it's a redefinition of home. Yeah. So uh, there yeah, are, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Lucy. No, it, it is very difficult. And I went through that with my own mother. I think what's important is to acknowledge them. It, it really depends what stage they're at. You know, if they really cannot reason with them at all, it does take time. They say it takes about six months to really, for, for people to really get used to the new situation. I think you need to validate for them and not, uh, and just tell them, I know that you want to come home. We could, I hate to say this, you don't want to lie to them, but at the same time, you want to appease them and so that they're not as anxious. So validating for them and saying, I know that you want to go home, we'll see what's going to happen, where I'm looking into it and just, you know, encouraging them and taking them and redirecting them. So if they're constantly talking about redirect them, if there's an activity going on, say, you know what, mom, let's go and see what, uh, let's look at the, hear the music that's going on. Redirecting people who are focused on something that you know that you, you know, you can't do anything about it is a really, really good tool to use. Right. It's just a um, little tool. Yeah, and I would also suggest, and this is based on what I've heard over the years on these calls, is bringing more things that are familiar to them from home to surround them with that. So that's also a suggestion. Yeah, for uh, my, oh, sorry. For my mom, one of the things that was so important to her, I did cook a lot for her, I have to say, and bring her home-cooked meals because she just hated, hated the food. Um, I didn't do it all the time, but that kind of kind of really supported and helped her a little bit. So anything that you feel that would make them feel more comfortable. Um, Beth Ann would suggested that making sure the facility has an automated computerized system versus manual reporting is helpful. So look for that. Okay. Um, and Robert asked a question. You mentioned nursing home compare. Is that also available for memory care, assisted living, et cetera? Freestanding assisted standing assisted living facilities. Um, I'm not sure, Robert, but I will look. I'll put that on my list to see if there are those for assisted living facilities. Um, and memory care is usually associated with a long-term care facility or assisted living, so they're all usually one, um, a bigger. Assessment. Okay, I see that it's eleven o'clock. For those of you that have to leave us, we're glad you joined us today and we hope that you'll come back. We're hoping that you will continue to stay with us and continue this conversation with Lucy. So we're going to take about a two minute break, get your water, um, go to the restroom, whatever you need to do in this couple of minutes, and then we'll be back and we'll continue the conversation. Thank you.